but you didn't come here to listen to me. You came here to listen to Bob Couture. All I'm going to say about Bob, uh, who is the COO, is that the right uh, title, at, uh, at uh, McGuire Woods. Uh, Bob was, I met Bob when he was actually a student in a, a class, an executive education class that we teach called Leadership in Law Firms. And we have some terrific people from our exec ed team here. Bob was in one of the very first classes. And he may have been one of the first in that category, which I'm going to urge you never to use, but you use all the time, called non-lawyers, you know, as if like, you know, non-humans or something like that. No, no. Other leading professionals who are taking major law roles in law firms and other kinds of uh, legal services organizations. And one of the things I told Bob is that people might be interested, in addition to the information that he's going to present, in asking him about the role. Uh, as you can see, he is an incredibly accomplished professional who had a high level role in a consulting business at Xerox and IBM uh, Consulting, but has been at McGuire Woods for now many years. He's one of the more senior people who's in this role. And quite frankly, he's one of the most thoughtful that I've encountered in my uh, working around the legal profession. He's going to talk a little bit about big law strategic positioning for tomorrow's legal landscape, which may be of interest to some of you. So, Bob Couture. Thank you very much, David. Unlike David, I don't have any advertisements this morning, so we'll get right into it. Um, how many of the people here first years, just to get a feel for the audience? First, second, third, graduates? That's a pretty good mix. Um, this presentation I'm going to give you is really built, I built it for the partners in our firm, about strategy. And it wasn't, let's go and build a strategy, but before you can do that, you have to understand where you are right now. You know, where are you swimming? What ocean are you in? And uh, I felt that if, if our partners could figure that out, and it was meaningful to them, it would be meaningful to you as students to understand this world of what we call the AMLA 100. Now, how many of you are familiar with what this AMLA 100 really is? Not many? Okay, it's a, it's a top 100 US law firms, and here's how they figure out what top means. It's how much revenue you've got, pretty much. And so they rank them by revenue. That's the primary measure, and so I expect Many, if not most of you, anticipate going to work for one of these AMLA 100 firms. Would that be correct? No? How many don't want to work for a big law firm? <laughs> we may have a few. Uh, OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what differentiates one firm for another. Because they always talk about the AMLA 100 as this monolithic group of firms. And they're not. They're all quite a bit different. And so if you can understand what differentiates one firm from another, you can figure out where you might fit and where you might want to be uh, when you start your career. So as David said, ask me questions as we go. Don't hold on to them uh, because I want to make sure that we have a good understanding as we go. And it's, it's just more fun that way. Um, I'm going to start with your participation. OK. so. What different, what things can you think of that differentiate one law firm from another? Yes, I'm going to write these down. Because if there's some I didn't think of, I'll steal from them and put it in the next presentation. Okay. So we got practice area. Another. Just call it out. Yeah. Um, the partner to associate leverage. Leverage. And, and so if somebody doesn't know what that means, it means if you've got 1,000 people in your law firm, how many are partners and how many are not? Yeah? Uh, whether there's a lockstep compensation for the partnership or whether it's a Lockstep or not. OK. Yeah? Geographic reputation. Geography. OK. Others? Um, Okay. Anything else? Clients. Clients, yes. Um, let me stick with clients for a minute. And let me ask you, if you're a client, what differentiates one firm from another? If you're going to hire a law firm, 
You're probably not interested in lockstep or <coughs> maybe you're interested in how much pro bono they do, but generally that's not your first criteria. Yes? Reputation. Yeah, the reputation. Um, say more about what the reputation means. Um, how many cases? Uh, the Experience. Yes. Right. Success rates. Success rates. And that translates to what? how much value they can deliver to you, right? The other thing that I, I associate that with is the sophistication of the work that they do. Some law firms do really sophisticated work, really hard cases. Some do ones that aren't so much. So we've got reputation. And value. Okay. That's, that's, that's pretty good. I'm going to add or put up here most of those. So we've got geography and size kind of go together. Practice areas we got. You're not partners yet, so you didn't put profitability. <laughs> Every partner will put profitability. Matter of fact, they would put that first. Uh, sophistication of the work, we got that one, and the value that they deliver. Nobody mentioned methodologies. Uh, because it's still rather immature in law firms. Consulting firms, where I spent a long time, have methods, right? If you work for Anderson Consulting, which is gone now, but if you did, uh, you'd go up to some place outside of Chicago and you'd spend a month learning something called Method One. This is how we practice. This is how we do things. Uh, and relationships. Relationships actually are quite valuable, but it's really hard to measure. So you look at this and you say, if we're going to try to characterize these firms, and these are the things we want to look at, what information do we actually have to do it? You can do a lot of research on 100 firms to find this. You're never going to find this one. This is very subjective, and nobody's going to answer that question. But we do have something. We've got profitability that's published. The American lawyer every year publishes their AMLA 100 list. And in there you can see how many lawyers they have, what their profitability is, what their geography span is. Uh, you can get practice areas and you can get size and geography. So when you start thinking about market differentiation, I stole something a little bit from my technology background from a firm called the Gartner Group. Does anybody know what Gartner is? Gartner has, they look at a lot of software products and they'll say, how sophisticated is the product itself? And they'll, they'll scale it. But the second criteria is, what's their ability, this company, to push that into the marketplace? So you can have the greatest product, or in this case, the greatest practice area with the smartest lawyer. But if you can't really push that into the marketplace because you don't have the scale, you're not going to make much of an impact. So what, what I've done is I've chosen the, the size in terms of the number of lawyers I have. That's the ability to push what they deliver into the marketplace. And two, I've got a proxy for this value to clients and sophistication of the work. There's one measure there that's called revenue per lawyer. And here's what you have to first believe in before this makes sense. Clients pay for value. So if one firm has a revenue per lawyer of a million dollars, another has 500,000, you're going to make the assumption that the value that clients perceive is greater in the million dollar firm, right? You buy that? Kind of? Okay. Buy it for now. Uh, and so if you try to build the axis of differentiation on those two things, it can give you a little bit of uh, insight. There's one more thing that I recently added here, and that's market share. This is a strange concept in the legal industry because nobody has any. The, the, the legal industry market in the United States is about $430 billion. $250 billion of that is outside law firms. So it's a $250 billion marketplace. And the largest law firm is two and a half billion, one percent. That's not very much. Could that change in the future? Maybe. Um, and probably, actually, I would say. Look at the accounting 
industry. That marketplace in the U.S. is $165 billion. And you know the big four, you know the KPMGs and the Deloitte and PwC, they have $125 billion. So the four firms have 75% of the marketplace. That's dramatically different than the law business. So why is law different? We could probably build a list of reasons. I don't know, but it is, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, nor does it have to stay that way for a long period of time. In my view is that the thing that's gonna change that is the buying behavior of the client. So as the clients get together and start to say, we've got a lot of legal needs, how do we hire our outside counsel? They're gonna start making some corporate decisions that are gonna put a lot of emphasis on whether or not a law firm can do the work and where they can do it for them. So I would expect that this market share could be something that's gonna change fairly significantly in the life, you know, the working life of everybody in this room. Maybe not David. <laughs> All right, so I built this chart and I call it the Amlaw 100. We're gonna look at 100 law firms and a primary axis of differentiation. So along this scale, we put how many lawyers do they have? And on this scale, we put revenue per lawyer. Now, I've seen this done before, but they always use profitability. Profitability doesn't mean anything because that's managed and can be managed. You know, let's say, let's say we're a law firm and uh, I split right down here. You guys are associates, you guys are partners. And profitability is, okay, how much money did we make? And divide it by these partners and that's our profitability. <clears throat> Well, next year we could change our mind and we could say only 14 people over here, partners, do the same calculation, what do you get? A really different answer. So you can't really rely on this profitability. So we're looking at revenue per, per lawyer because that's a, that's a number you can't manage. It's pretty simple. How much you know, revenue did, did you bring in and how many people do you have doing the work? So you, you say here's the, here's the playing field and you plot 100 law firms on this, and this is what you get. Does that mean anything to anybody? I actually asked my CFO to do this a couple of years ago, and he, I said, this is what I want plotted, and his analyst did, and he came back, he said, oh, there's nothing here, Bob. I said, what do you mean there's nothing here? He said, doesn't show me anything. I said, of course not, we don't have any context yet. Okay, so here's the first decision you have to make if you want to put some context in it. What's a big firm? How many lawyers? Somebody want to guess? Huh? 100 plus. 100 plus. Anybody else? So this scale goes from zero to out here, 4,500. 500 plus. <coughs> yeah. When I did this, I said it's 1,500. Okay. I mean, there's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, but you have to start someplace. We could say 1,000. But I said, here's 1,500. So let's say that's a large firm. So I put a line there that says there's 1,500. Now, just on, in some context, the, yeah. the Amlaw 100, the average size, is probably 600, 700. Mm -hmm. like right? And it's growing. Yeah. And it's growing. And you see some growing. combinations. Just to give you some idea right. of you know, what that means. <laughs> And then when you say revenue per lawyer, this one's really subjective too. You can pick a number. When I do this with partners, they, they throw out different numbers, but they're all pretty close around this million dollar range. So for this exercise today, I'm gonna say it's $900,000 per lawyer. So now we built this matrix and all of a sudden we've got four quadrants, surprise. So if I look at the law firms here in this quadrant, do they look similar? and do they look different than the law firms over here and here and here. Now, if you were a partner in one of these firms and I showed you the names, it'd be very inf informative. And I'm gonna do that right now. This is the Northeast Quadrant. This is a large law firm, more than 1,500, and your revenue per lawyer is up at, at uh, 950. There's only five. Skadden, Kirkland, Latham, Sidley, and Morgan Lewis. They merged recently with 
Guess who? You know who, right? Bingham? Bingham. Boston firm. Okay. You've heard of these firms? So this means the really big and the value they provide clients is very high. You go down to the next quadrant, the southeast, and here what you have is really large firms, but the value in revenue per lawyer is lower. So you look at Norton Rose, Denton's, k &L Gates, DLA Piper, Reed Smith, and the question is, do these all sound similar? I will tell you that many of them are. You might say, well, gee, why, why is Jones Day in there? I thought they'd be in the last group. They're not. I can move the line and put them with the other people. <laughs> and we can do that if we want. But it doesn't matter. There's no right areas or wrong areas to put this. And, and so you ask yourself, how did people get there? And if there's a strategic question as to did they just get there by accident or was it intentional, there's a managing partner of one of these firms <clears throat> who said, I want to be everywhere. I don't care what practices we're in. I don't care what work we're doing. I just want to be ever, anywhere. That's a strategy. I'm not saying it's a good strategy or it's a bad strategy, but that is their strategy. And so they have merged specifically with a number of firms to get themselves into that quadrant. So now you come around the circle and we're in the southwest quadrant. This is a pretty big quadrant. And this is the one where you're a smaller firm and your revenue per lawyer is less than 950. I don't know if there's any firms in here that you're familiar with or want to look at. But again, I will tell you when you talk to partners, they're very interested in, well, which one they're in, but also who else is around them. And then you go to the Northwest Quadrant. So this is Wachtell Lipton, Sullivan and Cromwell. Quinn Emanuel, Cravath, Simpson, Williams and Conley, Milbank. I assume you've heard of a lot of these. So these are firms that aren't necessarily huge by our standard of 1500, but do very high value work. So now what we've done is we've said, are these firms alike or are they <laughs> different? And I think you pretty much get an acknowledgement that these quadrants mean something. So now you say, if you were to run your own law firm, if you, could, if you could have any of these firms to run, which quadrant would you be in? Do you care? Sure you do. Does anybody I got a have, gut feel? I have one question first. Uh -huh. The firms that have a lot of international law um, they have a, what, a lot of offices? Yeah, no, but they have a lot of offices around the world. Yes. Are you including those numbers yes. as well? Yes. Because revenue in the U.S. is way higher than, our actual, not just revenue, income is way higher in the U.S. It than is, other. it is, it is. And so, in that case, if you've got a law firm with a lot of Latin American uh, offices, you're gonna, that's going to depress this number on the axis. You're exactly right. The firm that you should look at there was White and Case, right? White and Case was at the Top yeah. of the second, second quadrant. So, why your case is probably up here someplace. They're 800,000 per lawyer, mm -hmm. but they're very big and they, are in, they have many international offices, as opposed to, let's say, Latham, which is very big, but much of it uh, is concentrated in the United States or in the UK. So, that's a very now, just to be clear, the UK, the Magic Circle firms are not on here. Right. These are U.S. So law firms. That would be, and, you know, at some point it might be interesting to think about how they would relate. Yeah, we could do the Global 100. Yeah, we could. We could do the That's Global 100. That's version 2. 2.3. <laughs> so, oops, let me go back up. Was there another question here that did you know? You sure? Okay. We're not calling out the All right. By the way, that's not my ending slide for you. This was for the partners. It says, if you can segment the market, you can build a strategy, and you can translate that to some tactics. You're not there yet. <laughs> Neither are they. <laughs> well, no, there's, yeah, they're still thinking about it. Uh, okay. All right. 
when I did this with the partners in my firm, and we're right in the middle of the MLA 100, we're like 50 something. Um, well, they said, we'd like to be in this squadron. I said, if I'm running a firm, no, I'm over here. There's no right, there's no wrong. The reason I'm over here is because I spent 20 years at IBM. Always used to be in the big guy on the block, the very big guy on the block. And so you want to be big and you want to be the best and the highest value. I spent the first five years of my career explaining to people on mainframes why you pay two and a half times as much for the IBM machine than from the Hitachi machine, which was identical, <laughs> totally <laughs> identical. Uh, but everybody will have a different answer. Some people, and, and remember the, the, the managing partner I told you wanted to be everywhere? His strategy is to be out here. That's his strategy. So everybody can decide where they want to be because all these places are good places and you can make a lot of money in all of them if you run the business correctly. But here's the strategic question. If you are someplace here today, let's say you're there, and you decide you want to be here, what good will it do to merge with this guy or this guy or this guy? Not much. That'll push you over here. So there's a strategic implication to one, understanding where you are, and two, knowing where you want to go. And it's not an easy question to answer, especially in a partnership. Because if you have 200 people <laughs> with an opinion and a vote, good luck. <laughs> so I've been talking just about the AMLO 100, but you know what? The market's bigger than that. Let's talk about other people. There's a second 100. There's these new entrants coming. And then there are the accounting firms. I mentioned them before. Do any of of you think of the accounting firms as being in the legal business? Anybody? You? Well, <laughs> you're a rope for 10 years. You don't count. The answer will be think again. Everybody here is one of the most important things. All right, so, so I'm going to go right through these. This is the list of the AMLAW 200 firms. But notice something here. The top one, and I've listed them by revenue per lawyer, Irela Manella, 1.5 million. And, and their, re their rank in the AMLA 200 is 125. Well, just because they've only got 159 lawyers. And you go, it's total revenue. It's not this revenue per lawyer when they rank them. So there's some really good law firms here doing terrific work. And when you plot them, they're pretty much what you expect to be. But there's some really solid people up here. They're not that big but they're doing really terrific work. You might even consider some of them to be boutiques. So those are people, if you're doing a strategy and you're an AMLAW 100 firm, don't forget about them. And if you're a law student and you're trying to decide what kind of a firm you want to work at, don't forget about them. Now there are these new entrants in the legal marketplace. There's a lot of new people coming into the marketplace because clients are saying, we want more efficiency, we want more effectiveness, and we will split services apart. In other words, we'll break down the task into four different pieces and give some to the traditional law firms and some to some of these new startup firms. The UK passed uh, Legal Services Act in 2007 that allowed outside money to go into law firms, outside investors. That's changed their landscape. They're growing steady. And here's a few of them. So these are what we call LPOs or virtual law firms. So you've got in the US Axiom. Has anybody heard of Axiom? They got a thousand lawyers, so they're really pretty big. And half of the fortune uh, 100 companies have already hired them to do work. So if you're in an AMLA 100 firm, that's a real threat. You've got this one that was Clearspire. Interesting because they had lawyers and they had some software, some technology. Private equity firm bought them out, got rid of the lawyers, kept the technology, so now they're just a, a technology firm. Um, you've got VLP law. Basically they say, let's get some senior people 
we won't have any overhead, we won't have any offices, we can do it cheaper. So they're competing on a, a low cost model. Uh, and there's several more here and this, this, this list goes on and you can Google alternative law firms and you're going to find a lot of them. Atomic Law, Pangea 3, tell me if you've heard of any of these. You have, yeah. Um, interesting, Thomson Reuters actually acquired Pangea 3. We've had many of the people who run these things in the speaker's group. For those of you They're very compelling. It's quite a fascinating thing to hear them talk about. The then these guys have been around a little bit longer. Document review firms. So you've got Novus Law, Radiant in the UK, Huron Consulting up in Chicago. These are some people that came out of Anderson. Uh, they do document review and document management. And you might think that's commodity work, and it is, but they're using sophisticated technology to get it done. And then you've got technology-oriented legal services. Sky Analytics, Recommind. Some people are using game theory, fair outcomes. And I don't really know a lot about these. You just go to their websites, and this is what they tell you that they do. But they're being hired by corporations today to get things done. Care systems, very interesting, unlike the rest of them, because it's cognitive computing, just like IBM's Watson, which is powering Ross Intelligence right here. The Kira systems is really interesting. I saw a demo <coughs> of it recently, and what they're trying to do is teach computers to think. So before you had software that would go through and it would be the greatest search technology in the world. Now you can go through and they, they focus on uh, deal documents. Let's say you're doing an M&A and, and you want to look at thousands of documents for change of control provisions. You just show Kira what a change of control uh, uh, provision looks like and he'll go find everything that's a change of control. So they're really fascinating and they're getting smarter all the time. That's something you, as, as young lawyers, should pay very close attention to. Okay, I told you the accounting firms are getting into this thing, too. They are, in a big way. I wish this would work. Okay, here we go. So the American lawyer, um, two years ago, had this article, and it was titled, Be Afraid, Be Very Afraid, The Big Four Are Coming. It was kind of scary. Do you remember that? You know. And then a year later, The Economist uh, says, attack of the bean counters. Lawyers, beware, the accountants are coming after your business. And I couldn't help but take the article and get the little cartoon there. <laughs> this is your typical English bean counter with his calculator in his back pocket. And he's opening up his instant lawyer kit. And of course, he has a robe and he has a wig and he's all ready to go. So, what are they really doing? Ernst & Young has 1,100 lawyers right now, growing at 30% annually. Now, it may be beyond that at this point. These numbers are kind of hard to get. So when I get them, I, keep, I hold on to them because I'm interested. They're in 69 countries. <clears throat> in four years, I want to be in 80 countries. And they're hiring really good people. So they're going to firms, UK firms like Freshfields and, and bringing in their partners. Right now they do transactional uh, commercial employment law. They're not doing litigation. But look at where they are. They're in Europe, Africa, and Asia. They're not here. You know why? The bar won't let them. Yet. Yet. So what happens? I mean, I don't know what it's going to take, David. What's it going to take for this to change in the U.S. So for those of you who are interested in this, we did a whole issue of a practice on this. I have a giant research project called the Reemergence of the Big Four of the Market for Legal Services. We have actually up-to-date numbers on all this stuff. And uh, you know, there are regulations against lawyers and, quote, non-lawyers sharing fees, non-lawyers controlling law firms. That's what's keeping them out of this market. Uh, in the last revision of the ABA model rules, which was called Ethics 2020, there was a proposal to allow what's called multidisciplinary practice, which, by the way, is already allowed in the UK and many other jurisdictions. It didn't pass, but it came close. 
Uh, and frankly, I don't think the ABA may not be the ultimate arbiter because uh, this may become a trade issue. So if you look at TPP, which mm -hmm. many of you were thinking about in other contexts, or TTAP, you know, the Transatlantic Trade Partnership, or the GAT round, the GATS rounds on services, they all have rounds on the liberalization of professional services, which essentially would allow for multidisciplinary practice. So they're here, and by the way, they're already doing things like document management, litigation management, and support transactional evaluation, a whole bunch of stuff that law firms do too. Uh, they are going to be extremely important, well-funded. So there's a moat, or there's a wall, around the legal profession in the U.S., and what David's saying is that wall isn't that impenetrable. Yeah, like it could fall at any point in time. We don't know. For the, for the time being, it's a really nice thing to have if you're a law firm. But if it goes away, and it could get, go away overnight, you've got to consider these folks as your competitors. PwC says they're going to be a billion dollars <throat> within three years. They're in 80 countries uh, a year ago. KPMG, no surprise, focuses mostly on tax law, but they're already in 53 countries. These people are out there doing a lot of work, a lot of business. And Deloitte has a legal services group. They do M&A and tax work. And they're in 69 countries. So if you're sitting here as a United States law firm, you need to be really concerned about this. So here's the question. These new entrants that we just talked about, whether or not it's LPO or virtual law firms, or whether or not it's a technologist, or whether or not it's cognitive computing <coughs> that's going to practice, where do you think, or the accounting firms, where do you think they will enter this marketplace? Most of them are coming in at the bottom. Most of them are coming at the bottom because you're not going to break the bonds up here. Clients are paying a lot of money <laughs> to really good lawyers that they've had relationships with for 40 years or 20 years. And so it's hard to break in. They're coming in down here. I'll guarantee it. So if you're running a law firm, where do you want to fight these guys when they show up? Where do you want to be? <clears throat> now, you may have a strategy that says they're going to be big and they're going to be every place and they're coming at me here. That's why I'm gaining strength. If you're over here, you may have some time. If you're over here, you may have a real problem. But it's, but it's, a, it's a guess. You don't really know. OK, so we've only been looking at one point in time, 2015 data. Um, what I'd like to do is look at how these AM law firms have been tracking on this matrix over the last 10 years. So if you look at that, can you determine any strategic intent or direction? Um, let's take a look. So what we did is we took this data, because you can get it from the American lawyer, and OK. We've plotted it. So we've got 10 years of data. We start here, and the first one that shows up is Ackerman because they're A. But you can see they started here, they went up, they went down, they went over. And then in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they have a pretty good tra trajectory, so you know where they're going. Um, one of the ones that, that my firm tracks against is, uh, and, and we, we look just for benchmarking pur purposes, is Baker Hostetler. So let's look at them. And you say, well, what happened here? They were kind of moving around like this. They went straight up. And then they went to the right. And they went down. You never like to go down in value per lawyer over a year. So I said, I don't know what happened. You go and you Google and you see, oh, in January 14, they merged with a small IP firm. And so that pushed down their revenue per lawyer, but it increased their size. But look what they did after that. Their strategic move was 
these guys that we merged with are underperforming in the marketplace, we can get more value out of them and we'll take a one year hit to do that. So they said, our value will go down, but with our client relations, we can plug these guys in and we can derive more value from them. Uh, let me just show you a few others. Is there, is there anyone, anybody here wants to see? Just to stay on that just for a second, this is the story that every firm tells about mergers. Do you have a story where actually it doesn't work, which actually is probably 90% of the stories? We, we, we have some here at the end I'll show you. This, this is Cooley. This is an interesting one. If you started here 10 years ago and you ended up here, you say that's pretty good. But along the way here, you had kind of a circular, you know, what happened? I, I don't know. It's... And I'm not telling you that this, I did this just to see what it would look like uh, because we didn't know. Uh, Goodwin, Proctor, this is a, let's look at Goodwin. Okay, well, don't tell them I showed you this. I'm not being critical. This, there's, no, there's no criticism involved here, but but all of a sudden, you, you know, when I first looked at it, I didn't look at 10 years. I was only looking back the last four or five. And I started at this point, and I said, wow, they're not doing much. And then all of a sudden, they just took off. And I went in there, and I said, don't they got a new managing partner right here? And that was his first year. So he did something different. And what you can do is actually go Google these firms and see what happened, because their actions change the profile of the firm and what really happens here. Pardon me? Can I see yours? Yeah, it's kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> you can see anyone. Okay. All right. So, yeah, we, we haven't. If, if I went back further, we did a merger in 2008 of a Charlotte firm. We picked up about 160. And their revenue per lawyer was behind ours by about 40%. We took a huge hit on that. But it was the same thing I said before. We said, why do we want these guys in Charlotte? Well, Bank of America is headquartered there. <laughs> and this had been a North Carolina firm specifically, and we thought they were undervalued in the marketplace. So we took a bet that said, we can pull them up. And we did. Um, so that's us. I think uh, uh, O'Melveny was a good one. And why, here's why this is good. They went from here to here. All right? What was their strategy? They didn't like the firm. I shouldn't say this. This is my interpretation. They were way over here, and they said, you know what? This isn't where we want to be. So they went from close to 1,100 down to 600 lawyers. This is strategic intent. This isn't an accident. <laughs> they made decisions to do this. And you can see how they went um, left on, on, on a number of lawyers. So basically, they got rid of a lot of people they didn't think fit. They said, this is who we want to be. And so I, I, I look at them as successfully executing this strategy. Clary? <laughs> We can do anybody. Now, if you give this to some partners, you can't, you can't get out of the room. <laughs> because if you haven't learned this yet, these are the most, I shouldn't say anything about the partners. <laughs> Sorry, if you're in the coma side. They are so competitive with each other. All they care about is what somebody else is doing. I would come in you know, from my technology background, I'd say, hey, guys, we need to do this and this. And they'd say, well, who else is doing it? Right. Nobody. Well, then, why would we? Because nobody else is doing it. That's why we want to do it. <laughs> but that's not the way these guys think. So, yeah, here's Cleary. Um, they grew fast, but as they were growing, they were dropping their, quote, what I call value that they're delivering to clients. And then uh, and what year was that? And it starts in uh, 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So starting in 12, they kind of changed course. So interesting. 
two things. One, the international dimension has already been mentioned, but also, of course, you know, what was happening in 2008 versus Oh, it was, <coughs> you know, very Before tough times. New York law firms, tra heavy transactional focus, international deal making, took a huge hit. This is McDermott. It's a big Chicago firm. <laughs> we're kind of where they were <laughs> all the time. They're just, they're just there. And then... One more. Yeah. I just got a quick question. So, like, I've heard a lot of talks in where it's like, it's very enlightening about, like, the changes, like, what's happening and the entrance. Yeah. But it, you say, like, a lot of the speakers always say, like, you know, this is something you need to be aware of. But, yeah. Um, as a young lawyer entering at the bottom of the, of the baseline of the pyramid, like, are there any skills you should That's my learn? next chart. Oh, okay. That's my next chart. As soon as we're done with this, I was going to show you um, maybe two more. All right. Bob, I think you should go to that because it's 10 out of them. I'm going to show you one more because you all know this one. <laughs> Dewey. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So now we're going to go back over here. All right. So what should I be thinking about? I'm still playing with this, but I'm thinking about how the practice is going to be in, in, a f in, in 10 years from now, and maybe even today. On one axis, I've got the legal and regulatory framework. Is it certain? Do we know, is it settled? Do we know exactly what's going on? Or is it still ambiguous? And if it's more ambiguous, you need a different set of skills. You need a higher level of skills. And on this other axis, I say carbon. Any organic chemistry people here? I'm talking about people. <laughs> all right, this is people. And this is silicon. Computers, all right? So if that's the, the, the framework, you say, all right, who does this stuff? Certainty in the legal framework and the regulatory framework. Um, we need some people to do that. And there's a lot of that going on today. Probably not so much in the future. If you look over here, certainty, computers, smart software. If you go over here, the top legal minds, carbon and ambiguity. And ambiguity. And over here, we're talking about artificial intelligence and cognitive computing. All right, so here's what it's going to take. <clears throat> it's going to take some of these great legal minds to figure out how to do this and how to use this. And so what I'm telling you is young students, pay attention to this. Pay very close attention because your value to one of these law firms, if you come in, you understand how this works, you know what can be done, with Cura Systems as an example, you know what Watson can do, and you're going to see more applications in the legal industry from Watson before you get out of law school here. This is the skills they need, because you take a guy who's been practicing for 20 years, he doesn't want to do that. But they need people to do that. They need you to do that. Look, experience is great, but it blinds you to the future. And so that's where you can come in. So that's, so that's advice when we're like starting into the legal profession to think about these applications. Is there, thinking about this strategic direction in terms of when we're choosing firms, is there, are there certain things that we should look at or like given the entries? Here's what I would do. I would ask you when you're on camp, or the recruiters come on campus to talk to you, ask them some questions about this. What's your strategy? Where are you going? Why? <laughs> and if they can't give you good answers, you ought to go to a firm that can give you good answers. Because strategic intent, you remember that one I showed you where they're kind of going around in circles? Or, I mean, there's a hundred different ones you can look at, and they all look a little bit different. But you want to go to somebody who's got some strategic intent around what they're doing, I and think. And that, that strategic intent also maps onto some plausible view of where you think the market is going. Yeah. And then I also think that you're going to do it through like Christensen's uh, Mm -hmm. Can you, yeah, exactly. Can you imagine what's going to happen in this industry when those other entrants come in and this stuff starts doing the work? 
So two things. It's going to be is, massive. We a whole issue on the practice called disruptive innovation in the bargain for legal services. And uh, we had Richard Suskin, who does a lot of thinking about the application of technology law. It's a good place to begin to think about those issues. Yeah. Is there yes. Here? Yeah. So I mean, the people that make money off this aren't the people that just understand it, but the people that make it actionable. So I'm wondering from your perspective and what you do, how do you look at this and well, what do you do once you've decided that this is the correct representation of legal landscape today? So I don't, I don't give them the answer. I get the answer from them. So I go to the people and say, who are you and what do you want to be? You have to answer that credibly. And to say I don't know isn't going to work. And so on this axis, I can make a really good business case for every single quadrant. None of them are wrong. It's just, which one do you want to play in? And if you choose one, like if you choose especially this one, you better really be good in process and methodologies, right? This isn't necessarily big brain work. This is. But you have to be good at cross-selling on the bottom right. You have to be, you have a lot of lawyers for reason. Is that a bigger point? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have a coverage. Here's the other thing that could happen. Someday I could take a zero off this and it'd look the same. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it could. Yeah. Um, so this is all good information if you're going to manage a law firm, but for associates uh, going into a law firm, where do you think you know, you'd want to be at what firm in what quadrant? It depends on what kind of life you want to have. <laughs> uh, so what, what are the differences? Um, there's a cultural aspect to it. And, and I can't answer the cultural question. You have to get comfortable with that. But what I can tell you is if firms don't know what, where they're going and why, it's not going to be as much fun as people who have a really solid idea of who they want to be and why. And That's all I tell you. follow-up question. Does profit per partner have anything to do with anything? No, ignore that. Ignore that. Don't get caught up in the profit per partner thing. It's uh, it's it's a manageable number. It's a manageable number, and and look, you guys are going to do just fine over the course of your career, right? And so it's not going to be about the money. It's really not going to be about the money. Yeah. You have a list of factors on one of the earlier slides, and you sort of said it. One of the things I've added recently is um, market share. Market share. Yes. Thank you. And so the way you define market share is legal services, and no one law firm has more than 1% share of legal services right. in the United States. But really, you're talking about hundreds of markets there. You're talking about a market for antitrust work. You're talking about a market for M&A work. So when you factor that in, does that give you something actionable? You say that there's firms that really are like killing the, the M&A space, the, the antitrust space. It does, but you know where they are on this? They're actually they're going to be a guarantee on the left side of this chart. And they could be below this line, they could be above this line. There's actually another, there's another book that Bruce uh, McEwen wrote about um, the taxonomy of law firms. He said there's seven different flavors. And so I took his, uh, his, his seven different flavors and the law firms that fit within them, and I plotted them there. And, and, and Bruce and I actually did a joint presentation on that. And sure enough, they fit exactly where you thought they were going to fit. Um, so. If you, if you just want to work for an M&A firm, and they do that, and they do that really well, I mean, that's a really good position. But most of these firms here have multiple practice areas. They don't get to be in the AMLO. Well, I shouldn't say. There's, there's a number of them that, that are, but they're usually smaller, just because there's not that much work. OK. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much and uh, good luck.